started. Hi, everyone. My name is Jillian McMaster. I'm the Education and Marketing Associate at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. Um, for tonight's Let's Talk Art episode, we have Sarah Hall, our director, and Daniel Folco, our Agnita M. Stein Schreiber curator. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight, and thanks for being patient as we um, managed our uh, tech here for a few minutes. Um, it's a webinar format tonight, so it's always a little funny because we kind of feel your presence, but we can't hear you. Um, but do feel free to ask questions, and I'm always a big, it's okay to to interrupt us if it's a question that seems better answered in the moment, um, that's fine by me. Um, so one thing that I have found over my long museum career is that people are genuinely interested in the way we do our jobs. I'm always a little surprised that if I tell them about, you know, gee, I walked through that show and everything seemed too low for me. So I decided we should do it two inches higher. They, they find that stuff really interesting. And I'm often asked questions like, you know, how does something like that travel? Um, how do you decide what you're going to put in a show? How long did it take you to plan this? Um, all of those things are really easy questions to answer and interesting questions to answer when you have organized your own exhibition. So um, I will tell you in my experience, um, planning exhibitions is a lengthy process. Um, you can pull one together fast if there's uh, urgency, maybe you're responding to a community issue and you wanna get something up that responds to, to something happening, you can do it in a few weeks, but most loan exhibitions where you're borrowing art from private collectors and other museums, really about the fastest you can do it is 18 months. Museums need like a one year turnaround to be able to bring loan requests in front of their board, um, assess whether their art can travel and approve the request. Most exhibitions are more like a three to five year timeline. Um, so we're gonna explain to you using our Joshua Johnson exhibition. And there are a few pictures from my past life sprinkled in here that make nice illustrations. We're gonna try and take you through the story of how an exhibition comes together. Um, it is one of the most gratifying aspects of museum work, I think. And uh, I'm gonna let Daniel, he's put together this great PowerPoint. I'm gonna let him start talking and I will probably interrupt him as is my style. Alrighty, thank you, Sarah. And tonight we're gonna give you a sense of how the Joshua Johnson exhibition that's coming up at the museum uh, took shape. You know, what were its origins? And as the title here says, what goes into making it possible? And the exhibition in question is called Joshua Johnson, Portraitist of Antebellum, Maryland. Um, actually, Portraitist of Early American Baltimore. Correction on that. The Antebellum, Maryland part, as I'm looking at it, was the name of my online class that I taught. So just to insert that correction there. And it opens April 17th. And for those of you that are able to come, we encourage you to come. It will be running through October 24th. So it's our summer and autumn exhibition. And the origin of this exhibit goes back actually to about 2016, 17. And there are some key individuals. You know, a show, it really is born with a discussion among different individuals. And it's usually among colleagues. And there are a couple of people at the museum who really deserve credit for this. Uh, the museum does have an exhibition committee comprised of staff who discuss what are you know, going to be good concepts for shows. And um, our former director, Rebecca Massey Lane, should be credited with developing this concept in conjunction with my predecessor, Nancy Zinn, who was the uh, curator at our museum as well before I got there in 2017. And, these two colleagues initially sort of came up with this idea in discussion with another colleague named Mark Letzer, who we'll talk about afterwards from the Maryland Center for String Culture. And the discussion came about because the museum, as some of you are aware, has two Joshua Johnson portraits. It, it, this show particularly has its origins with our collection. So that's where it came about. And these discussions based upon the two portraits we have in our collection sort of led to this idea among our predecessors here that we should do a show about this. And it was suggested by Mark Letzer, who's the director of the Maryland Center, that an exhibition was long overdue about Joshua Johnson. And why not use our Yo family portraits that you see there as the springboard for this? So it starts with these kind of informal discussions, uh, a gallery tour, and um, getting things down on paper. 
So tell me a little bit about our General Johnsons, though. Um, what's their backstory? How did they enter the collection? They entered the collection in 1994 as a gift of a Washington County um, business owner named Sid, uh, F. Sidney Kushwa. And these paintings actually passed down through his family. And I believe it was a great, great grandparent removed who had them. So he's descended from the sitters here, Benjamin Franklin Yo, senior and junior, who is married to Susan Amos Yo. And here's also Mary Elizabeth, the daughter over her. So th the paintings came from this Washington County resident and donor to our museum. And he gave them along with some other uh, works of art in 1994. And at the time, it was actually a very big deal. Um, Gene Woods was the director of the museum and they were featured in the Baltimore Sun as well as the local papers. So we have a, that would be a 27 year history with these paintings. So it's, it's really what forms the basis of this whole idea. And then discussions continued um, thinking about the importance of Joshua Johnson, who is the first, one of the first ma uh, major African-American professional artists. There were people who preceded him. However, many of those individuals were enslaved. So he's the first free black artist who established a firm reputation as a portraitist in America. And our work builds upon a really important exhibition that occurred in 1988. And that was held at formerly Maryland Historical Society called Maryland Center for History and Culture. And that was shared with the Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Museum in Williamsburg, Virginia that you see here. These two institutions had this large exhibition of some 100 pieces from 1988. The pictures on the cover in detail, you'll see this afterwards, of one of the Everett boys. Um, and that's part of the Everett family portrait. So we're building upon the work of those people, but this is with new research. And we'll tell you more about the exhibition in a separate program, series of programs once we come to the exhibit in some months from now. But those discussions continued. We, and this is pictured up here as our co good colleague, Mark Letzer. He's the director, uh, excuse me, the president and CEO of the Maryland Center for Extreme Culture. It is a new name because it's rebranded uh, itself. And his vice president for collections here, Allison Tolman. And through the discussions with them in meetings, Rebecca and I also met with them uh, considerably. We decided this really made a lot of sense to do it. And you might ask yourselves, well, why the Maryland Center? And the reason is because they have the largest collection of Joshua Johnson paintings in America. And it's something that they're very proud of. And uh, Mark and uh, the board at the Maryland Center decided this was a great opportunity to showcase their collection and to collaborate with another Maryland museum. So this is really jump back, my name is, um, which is that you know the idea for the show comes from this this great gift, and it's it starts people thinking even if it sort of gestates over time, and that's often the case. Like you get given a wonderful object and you start thinking about how can you use that object. Sometimes it's local stories that need to be told. Um, and I think with uh, with this Joshua Johnson show, we can we're doing both in, in a way. We have a great, really wonderful regional story that's also really important to the nation. Yes, absolutely, Sarah. And another thing that drove this was the um, the uh, new initiatives that we have at the museum, which begin in part with the Blues and the Abstract Truth: Voices of African American Art and Exhibition that we organized in 2019 is part of the museum's new focus on featuring African-American artists and their work. And Joshua Johnson absolutely fits into this. In addition to the fact that he is an artist of not only national importance, but also significance within the state of Maryland and the mid-Atlantic region. He is an artist who is inherently connected to Baltimore, the history of our state and the development of our nation. And that is antebellum America. So those are some other factors that are key to mention. Initially, sorry, Daniel. Some of you who are on here know I have a kitten and she just decided to try to take the computer and drag it across the room. So 
<laughs> my apologies. And initially, this, the discussions, this is another thing, uh, Sarah, feel free to jump in, is sometimes you go into planning a show and you think, oh, we'll only be able to borrow X number of paintings. But, and that's kind of how it started with Maryland Center was on the initial visits, oh, the, we could loan you three or four. And that's what I'm showing here is the initial discussions. When I visited the center were, for example, to borrow Johnson's portrait of Isabella Milholland here, Elijah Stansberry, and perhaps just the James McCormick family. But as time went on, the center sort of changed its um, mind in terms of the ability to lend more works. Sure. Yeah. Uh, when you're doing research, I think that um, curators often will plan a checklist that's, and, and checklist is what we usually use in museums to describe the list of works that are going to go in a show. And they'll often, you know, plan a very generous checklist because some loans are going to be refused and some loans might be refused because of condition issues. You know, the, the work isn't stable enough to travel or maybe it's a pastel. People will very rarely um, loan pastels because they're so sensitive to vibration. Um, there's a lot of uh, things you have to do to safely travel a pastel. Sometimes people will just say no immediately if it's something on panel because wood responds to humidity changes so much. So you always want to have sort of more things in, in your pocket than what you expect to be able to get from people. Um, but the happy story is here, um, I guess COVID fallout in a way um, has, has allowed, you know, museum programming has slowed enough that we ended up being able to borrow more than we asked for originally. That's exactly right. And that was really uh, fabulous. The, the initial visit uh, involved discussing the exhibition logistics a bit, but also going into storage and being shown at Maryland Center what they had to offer what might be available, ranging from the Joshua Johnson portraits to the George Beck landscape that you see on the left. So I'll just say, um, I, I wrote a little article about planning exhibitions that's gonna be in a local magazine, I think in April. Um, so I pulled up some of that to use as a reference here. And one of the things I did in that is enumerated, like so, what are the costs for an exhibition? So what Daniel's talking about right now is, yeah, you're often sending your curator out to examine paintings, to um, go to collections and museums, to talk to curators, because what you want them to do is you want them to understand your project. You want them to get excited about your project and want to participate in your project. So when it comes in front of their collections committee, they're advocating for the loan on your behalf. So you really want to, to get a, a verbal yeah, we're in support of this before you even do any of the paperwork for loans, which is typically director to director. So one director writes to the other director and says, may we borrow your three Joshua Johnsons for this exhibition. You really do set out in that loan request letter, your thesis and why those paintings support your thesis, because you know you could borrow somebody else's paintings. Um, so why is that painting important? Um, so there's this process. So, you know, I started out talking about cost. So the travel and the research is, is cost. Um, there's also um, costs involved in conservation. So sometimes um, somebody will say, well, we'll lend you that if you, um, if you pay for some minor conservation, it needs a travel frame. Oh, gee, we, we think it really should be glazed before it travels. Um, so depending on how key that piece is to your story, you may agree to cover some of these costs. And in the museum world, we do try to keep costs down for each other because if we ask for everything, um, it hurts all of us, right? Exhibition costs being high hurts all museums. On the other hand, being able to use an exhibition to get conservation done is really helpful. So we do often agree to, cons to pay for conservation of other institutions work in order to be able to um, have it be look beautiful for our show too. We, we want things to look great and to be safe to travel. So um, that's a potential cost. Um, building crates, you would be surprised at how expensive crates are. We'll see some pictures of them later. There's shipping, there's insurance, there's honoraria for any speakers you might bring in, for catalog authors you might bring in, and maybe for teachers who might design programs. And then there's catalog design and production. Um, and cost of installing and cost of having a party, although 
not right now. <laughs> We're not having parties right now. But anyway, I just thought it'd be nice to run down some of the things that contribute to the expenses involved in an exhibition because fundraising is part of the story too that I'm sure Daniel will, will touch upon, so. Yes, absolutely. And in terms of the fundraising, even before we started to get into official loan requests, one of the things that we worked on with Rebecca, as well as Wallace Lee, who's our development director, is identifying funders. And these come usually initially in the form of foundation support. So for example, the Joshua Johnson exhibition, we applied for funding um, from the Art Dealers Association of America Foundation, which was very eager to support the catalog and direct costs of the exhibition. You also have a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts that has made this possible, in addition to our many generous private sponsors. So it's a combination of different um, forms of funding that allow this to happen. And those are critical. Once you've identified those, what it does is it adds fuel to the project. It propels it. Right. You, you, you really get buy in. And, um, and also all of those applications, you know, particularly, you know, formal funding applications, you have to prepare a budget and you have to write a narrative. So that's helping you sharpen your thinking and figure out your scope of work. Um, and uh, I, I should acknowledge, I think we have one of our funders on this call, the Heart of the Civil War Heritage Area. So thanks, thanks for your help. Yes, we very much appreciate your support. And then also, as we were thinking about how do we conceptualize this exhibition, we will touch on it later. Part of it is the exhibition catalog. Um, and we'll sort of, as we get towards the end of the presentation, we'll, we'll uh, touch on that. But it was Rebecca's suggestion that we contact scholar David Tafteri, who's pictured here in this slide. Uh, he's a historian of uh, specifically the struggle and the urban South. This is one of his books. And he talks about um, the issues of race and slavery in Maryland and the mid-Atlantic from the 18th century all the way through the 20th century. This is his book about confronting Jim Crow in Baltimore before the movement. And David Tafteri was a great recommendation from Rebecca. He's a professor of history here at Morgan State University, which is an important historically black college in, um, excuse me, black university in Baltimore. And he turned out to be an excellent uh, choice because he has such expertise, not only about Joshua Johnson, but his broad cultural historical context. And so David is writing a catalog essay and he will be participating in a future Let's Talk Art, in fact, next month. So this was a great opportunity to collaborate with our colleague here in Maryland. So did you have, a, by the time you involved David, did you really have a firm thesis or did conversations with him? This is because folks, um, some of you know, I came on in July. Um, this exhibition was supposed to open be done with by now. It was delayed because of COVID. And I consider that a COVID silver lining because it's such a wonderful show. I'm really happy to, that I have been able to become a part of it here in its last months of planning. But anyway, um, I was interested in knowing how, how much of a thesis you had developed at that point when you got talking with David. By the time we got talking with David, we had pretty much sharpened the overall focus. And then after uh, some discussions with him, he helped to sort of orient me towards particular sources that might help the project in terms of conceptualizing and viewing Johnson within late 18th and early 19th century Baltimore. So he's also, to a certain degree, served in an unofficial advisory capacity. And that's kind of how that was. So we were kind of well along in the, in the stages of planning as we uh, began to reach out to him. Um, we have a couple questions here in the Q&A and um, in the chat. Um, the first question we got was, given the allowable loaned art, how do you ultimately choose those ultimately displayed? Well, that's a very good question. That will come down to a number of sort of factors that we have to face, particularly the distance that these works are coming from. What is the geographic radius that we can handle within our budget? So we, we look at what we are able to um, um, afford and we will make a decision based upon that. We also look at what are the likelihood of the loans. And I say this um, you know, with a sort of um, to, to let you know that it can be difficult for smaller museums to borrow, for example, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art 
or the Art Institute of Chicago, because those institutions have often many requests, sometimes for the same painting, and their loan fees can be very high. So we consider very carefully what is within our region that's very compelling, uh, that would be a strong example, and that we can realistically bring here. And sure. Just, yeah. I have an example of working you know, on an exhibition in my prior position where we had an, a, a painting we, we quite liked and we asked for. And then it was a private collector and they came back and said, well, we really, you know, it's, it's a prominent piece in our house. And could you um, supply something from your collection to replace it? Could you, if you can't do that, could you make a high resolution reproduction of the painting that we're going to lend you and put it in maybe some kind of frame you have at the museum and hang it in our place? And I, they were working actually with art advisors who I don't know if the art advisors had told them like, try to get as much as you can out of the museum as possible. But I ended up telling them, you know, your painting is really nice, but we don't need it that badly to do that for it. Um, you know, that's just going to increase our costs too much. They decided that the prestige of being in the exhibition was worth having a gap on their wall. Um, but, you know, you're like, you're nice. You want to, you want to have a great relationship with these people, but sometimes things are just too costly that, that people expect or ask for. Yes. And this goes for museums. You know, sometimes you may not want to do the conservation that the museum is asking for, or um, it just becomes really cost prohibitive in terms of transportation, as you mentioned, Daniel. Exactly. And it also comes to what the final decision is for the institution you're borrowing from. And with the Baltimore Museum of Art, here I picture our two um, colleagues who are working on this with us. This is Asma Naim, who's the a chief curator at the Baltimore Museum of Art, and then her colleague with whom I also am working, Virginia Anderson, who's the head of American art at BMA, and uh, that's in Baltimore. And so initially we requested three paintings from them. This one, Charles Herman Stricker Wilmans, but because this is a cornerstone of their American galleries, they were unfortunately unable to loan it, which is fine. So after visiting storage and talking to Virginia and, um, Having further discussions, it was decided by them that the museum would be able to loan in the garden, which is this portrait of a little girl up here. And it's a really very interesting in terms of the symbolism. And then down below, a gentleman of the Shure family. So sometimes if you can't get everything that you asked for, you come to an agreement as to what will work out. And it's perfectly understandable. So those kind of discussions will happen a lot. And then it, it was sort of thinking about what other Baltimore area organizations have Joshua Johnson paintings and discussions. Uh, this was something that I sort of discovered is looking at Joshua Johnson. It's the Archdiocese has a fabulous painting of John Carroll uh, that we, we would like to borrow. It took quite a bit of time because the Roman Catholic Church has many different divisions. The ultimate decision lies with um, the Archbishop William E. Laurie, who's pictured up here. And then the logistics are handled by his colleague. Her name is Trisha Pye. And she works in the archives here at St. Mary's Seminary. Some of you may have heard of it in Baltimore. So with Trisha's assistance, the portrait here of John Carroll, first Archbishop of America, is going to come to our museum. And it has a really neat connection to the exhibition and to the history of the state because it's connected here to Baltimore Basilica, which was built under Carroll's watch. And the painting for probably since Joshua Johnson created it was, has been on view in the dining room of the Archbishop's residence, which is pictured here. It's really a, a fine early federal building, part of the complex of the early federal basilica. So this is a really neat story and it broadens our understanding of Joshua Johnson. And it's within our range in terms of borrowing. He was Catholic, yeah. which I think is, he was Catholic. And his children That's right. were baptized in the Catholic Church. Yeah. Exactly. And that it's it, Joshua Johnson's children, as Sarah was mentioning, were baptized in the Catholic Church, hence the connection to the Archbishop. So this adds another dynamic in terms of understanding Johnson's life and people with whom he came into contact in the city at the time. So we'll look forward to telling you more stories about that. 
the loan that comes from the furthest afield is from the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, which is being worked on in collaboration with our colleague here. Her name is um, uh, Laura Latman, and she's the collections manager. So Bowdoin College Museum of Art is part of the college, which is in Brunswick, Maine. So that's coming from quite some distance. So this is a little bit more of a reach, but we're very happy to have the painting. And this is very significant because it's one of two portraits that Johnson did of an African-American individual. This one believed to represent the minister Abner Coker, who was a minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Baltimore in the early 19th century. So this painting is really critical in terms of coming down and being part of this show, because again, we have a, a broadened sense of Joshua Johnson's cultural milieu and the fact that he was tied to very closely the African-American community in Baltimore and also potentially abolitionist circles. And again, the only other portrait of um, an African-American individual is overseas in Bath, England. And I should mention we had written the Bath Museum in Britain to see if they would loan that painting, but they were unable to. So we came back to and uh, th this portrait of uh, Coker and decided that it would sufficiently tell that story. So just a little bit of um, uh, behind the scenes in terms of how we explore different options and times you think the show is gonna go in one way, but it doesn't necessarily follow that trajectory. Um, Dan, we have another question. Um, did you ask for portraits from the National Gallery of Art? The works they own from their collection, from their own collection, and the former Corcoran would seem to be vital to presenting various aspects of Johnston's career and sitters. That's the first question we got. That's a very good question. We actually did not because at the time we were dealing with a more modest budget, and we thought that it might not, we might not be able to afford it. Um, and also, uh, the other thing that we had to take into consideration was how many pieces could we realistically pull into this. And we decided because we were already being loaned a significant number from the Maryland Center for History and Culture, as well as these other institutions that that would be within our means. Um, so I hope that that, that it helps to clarify that question. It would have been nice to have National Gallery, but um, yeah, I, I, um, and again, I, I, I'm getting some the sound interference and I apologize. My husband's texting me. That's terrible. Um, so I apologize to all of you. I'm not sure why. But I, again, I came to the project later, but my sense is scope for our museum, you know, was defined to really be Maryland, you know, sort of talk, exploring his Maryland connections and the Maryland collections. And also um, what Daniel has done that in terms of scholarship is really delve into the European influences and the symbolism a little bit more than prior scholars have done. So um, that, that's my understanding. Absolutely, Sarah. And as you will notice when the exhibition catalog is produced to go back to that previous question, works owned by the National Gallery are pictured in the catalog. And I do discuss them and reference them as they relate to Joshua Johnson's work. So even though we weren't able to bring the pictures um, themselves to Hagerstown, they are acknowledged and incorporated into the, the story, into the project. So um, a, a larger scale project, um, perhaps with more funding, something like that might have been able to bring together double the number of works. but that was um, a little bit unwieldy for where we were at the time. So just a little addition to that. The other question that we got um, is, uh, Johnson's story is Baltimore centric, but the works in your collection had a Washington County history. Will your exhibit explore Johnson's relevance to Western Maryland? Absolutely. And um, we'll go back a couple of slides here. We have several subjects that relate to Western Maryland history. This gentleman here, Greenberry Wilson, married a woman named Louisiana Orndorff of Washington County, the Orndorff family that was very closely involved in agriculture and grist milling um, in the county. And we will tell his story and his wife's story. 
So it's very interesting because you have a Baltimore, Hagerstown, Washington County connection. And then if we go back here to the beginning, we've also got the Yo family. And the Yo's owned a uh, business within uh, Washington County uh, tailoring business. And they moved into this, uh, they moved from Baltimore out to Western Maryland. So we are going to be able to tell a number of stories that connect with that. And let me just go back to where I was before. Western Maryland also plays an important part of the picture with other artists who connect to Joshua Johnson and who actually worked in Baltimore at the time. This fellow here, Frederick Kemmelmeyer, a German immigrant to the United States, he uh, had a studio in Hagerstown. So stay tuned for more about that uh, when we move along. So as I was talking about it, the expanding of the scope of the exhibition, we want to see how does Johnson relate to his cultural and artistic context? Well, we have to compare his work to comparable works by other artists, namely Frederick Kemmelmeyer, or for example, this is from our collection, I should add, and this portrait of a little girl holding a rose, because you have very different, very similar kinds of symbolism. Different artists, but the same sorts of focus on childhood and portraits of kids. Here holding a goldfinch and strawberries, and then this little girl has a rose. We don't know who the artist is who did this painting, but it's very much in the manner, very similar to Joshua Johnson. And then what are the nitty gritty aspects of an exhibition? What goes into it? Well, uh, Sarah can tell you more about these photos, but it starts with transporting the art to the institution. Uh, these folks are cool. <laughs> I can't tell you more about them. No, I just thought- A little bit. <laughs> I just thought um, that it gives a good sense. Um, often people wonder, you know, how is artwork packed? What, what's involved? I mean, most museums as part of the process of approving a loan and um, going through um, committee approvals are, you know, we mentioned before, looking at the condition of the artwork, determining if it's safe to travel, is it stable for travel? Does it need conservation? And then crate building. And, you know, I may have been out of um, curatorial for long enough that um, last I knew, you know, a crate was 12 to $1,500. They're probably more expensive now. They're like pieces of furniture, you know, perfectly designed to safely transport the object. Here you have an old, old picture of me doing condition reporting. So of course, um, one of the things most, most people don't know outside of the museum world is that when you receive the artwork, it stays in the crates usually for a minimum of 24 hours to gradually acclimate to the new environment in the museum after travel. And so then when you unpack things, you immediately um, check their condition. You do a report, um, which, you know, there was an outgoing report done at either the prior museum, uh, either the owner or the prior venue for an exhibition. And then you take a look at everything very carefully um, before you put it on display to just make sure um, no damage was incurred during travel or no environmental fluctuation has caused any issues. Um, and the big trucks, I, I'll tell you, um, I'm sure there, they'd be a challenge here in, in Hagerstown, but boy, were they a challenge um, where I worked in Pittsburgh. <laughs> no loading dock and, and really tricky, tricky. You'd occasionally get an excellent truck driver who could just do it. And then there were others that would take 40 minutes to get their truck in place. Yes, and so once say, in a while that's happened. <laughs> another nitty gritty thing is that every museum has what the, what's called a facility report where they put down the details about their museum. Like, do you have a loading dock? Is it covered? Um, you know, how far does art have to travel to get into your building? Um, do you have trained art handling personnel rather than volunteers? Um, are you in an earthquake area? How far are you from the fire department? There's a really comprehensive document that we all complete and we all look at it. So if, if someone requests a loan from us, we ask to see their facility report to dis determine whether, you know, we feel that it's as, at a professional standard that we're comfortable lending to. Oh, this is funny. I told Daniel that I probably had some funny pictures of crate building gone awry. So every once in a while, we would take in a show where, you know, they just weren't thinking about how are you going to get things out of the bottom of the crate. <laughs> and, and I will say that that's Bridget. 
And she's not that small of a person, but she can't reach in there. And um, I will also say that uh, it actually was not artwork in that crate, but display parts, but it was still uh, quite a challenge. And the other smaller person there in the picture actually ended up climbing inside that crate to help get things out of it. <laughs> and uh, in terms of uh, staging an exhibition, you know, some museums have really sophisticated design departments or hire outside exhibition designers. I've never been at an organization with a budget that allows that luxury. Um, so uh, I did a lot of that myself when I worked in Pittsburgh and um, with, a, with a great team of installers that I had worked with for years. This is actually a glass exhibition back from like 2004, where we were doing these little just sort of cylindrical rolls of paper about the size of the objects in order to be ready. Um, we had a lot of couriers for that show. That's something we haven't talked about, but sometimes a museum will agree to a loan, but say, you know, that piece needs to travel with someone from our museum and someone from our museum needs to oversee the unpacking and installation. And so um, that show, there were a lot of couriers. So we needed to really know exactly what we were gonna be doing. We couldn't make a lot of changes. Um, to things. And sometimes I would work with brown paper maquettes, which um, a lot of museums do. I find that if you actually have the time to do that in advance, um, I might have make only two changes to an exhibition because you get a sense of the way things are going to feel. Um, so working with maquettes is really helpful. Um, my story about the paper cylinders is really funny because after that glass show, some years later, we did a Fabergé show. And I went to one of my installers and said, can you do like little, you know, remember how we had those little rolled paper things that stood it? Can you do that for me for this? And she actually made, <laughs> she, she got really into it and she spent far too much time and she made all these like fake Fabergés, which I'm sure larger museums do pay people to do. Um, but uh, it was kind of funny because we joked around that we were going to auction off the, the little, the little paper Fabergés afterwards, portraits of the czar and like, paper crumpled up to look like rock surfaces. Um, it was quite fun, but I was paying for that. <laughs> I didn't, didn't really wanna pay for that. If I'd known, I would have said stop. Um, the, uh, then you see, there's a little picture of me in the gallery working actually with both within the gallery and with the mech head of the gallery at the same time. Um, so, fun, yes, fun and one thing to add is that now with the um, pandemic posing challenges for museums, there's more of a move within the field to transition from couriers in person to a Zoom or some other virtual video of a staff member at the loaning institution overseeing the installation via screen within the gallery. And yeah. we, yes. So about, uh, there was a big article, I think, in the art newspaper about this a couple of weeks ago. There was a huge um, deinstallation at the Musée Barberini um, that was done via Zoom, I believe, with people zooming in. And I think they put tracking devices on the crates. Um, I'm ambivalent, you know, maybe I'm old, um, but I remember a time when an entire show was going from Pittsburgh to Miami going through the Appalachians and there was a terrible, terrible snowstorm and I was so glad my courier was on that truck and I could talk to her. And so that, you know, we're like both following the Virginia Highway Department on Twitter where, you know, there's no, you don't want anybody to leave the shipment. And without my courier being on that truck, I had no clue whether the truck drivers were going to decide to leave the truck on the side of the road and, and, and trudge to the nearest truck stop or something. So it was really comforting to me to have a courier there. I um, mean, I've heard that the Zoom thing kind of slows things down a lot um, when you're working, but it is expensive sending couriers. So, you know, yes. there's gotta be some middle ground. Courier trips are a great opportunity for museums to do research too. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think we all do have to be mindful of each other's budgets. Like we want to help each other do good work. So we should not be inflating costs unnecessarily. I guess that'll be my little moralizing point. <laughs> but I will, uh, just to follow up on that, I will say it is a lot, great fun to, to do a currying trip. I, I had a chance when I worked at New Britain Museum of American Art to go to um, Beijing. Uh, accompanying several American paintings over there in 2007. And it was an amazing experience. You meet many new colleagues 
and you learn how other cultures install exhibits and how they present art to their uh, visitors, to their public. Oh, so, you're, you're absolutely right, Danny. And they're exhausting and stressful. You know, sometimes you're up, yeah, I'm sure you were up a long time on your way to China. Sometimes yes. you're up like 36 hours by the time you had truck rides to plane rides and going through customs and all of that. Um, but it is, I mean, it's a great research and networking opportunity and it connects people with their colleagues for sure. Definitely. Okay, this is back to like um, my past. Um, I did a whole behind the scenes program for Elder Hostel about that glass show I was talking about. So this was just a database we had set up, you know, most museums have collections databases. I was a real purist. I liked our collections to be separate from the database we used for exhibitions. So we use separate databases for the exhibitions, but each lender would have a page. And, you know, so if you're doing a really big loan show, so this is a modestly sized exhibition we're talking about, Joshua Johnson, with a, you know, lenders you can count on one hand, but sometimes you're dealing with 40, 50 lenders and you know 75 100 or more pieces of art and so you're actually needing to to have a person who's really just staying on trap tra on top of this we sent out the loan requests on september 1st we're going to follow up on october 15th and make sure it landed on the right person's desk and that they're looking at it um oh they said they were going to do it at this meeting on December 3rd. Let's check up with them after that meeting and make sure that you know we were approved. So there's a lot of um, logistical shepherding going around and issues like insurance. Are they, you know, some museums do insist that um, you pay their premium and they keep the piece on their own uh, insurance policy. Other museums want you to give them a certificate of insurance um, showing that you will be responsible um, for the work. Um, you need to get images for the catalog. If you're doing a catalog, I mean, gosh, just getting getting all the images um, is a job <laughs> for sure. It definitely is. And that's the, it's almost a separate job, but not really a separate job from the putting the show up itself is putting the book together. Um, you know, without the pandemic, we would have people coming on site. These are just some shots from previous installations at the museum. And we, uh, we also thank and credit our colleague, Kay Palmatier, who's on the right. She's our, the museum's collections and exhibitions manager. She oversees and will oversee these kinds of activities, the uncreating of the paintings and the um, uh, correspondence with the other registrars at the lending institutions, all the, the pickups and coordinating all of that to be done sort of seamlessly and in an organized manner so that we have enough time to get the show um, staged and, and up in the galleries. But the catalog is sort of a separate job and in its own regard. It's something that the catalog itself, I started working on this almost a, uh, over a year ago, actually. So um, the planning goes back before that, but I started you know, writing it and researching it in the end of 2019. So it's a long time in, in, in the making. It will be a, a 120 page publication. So and, I, uh, yeah. Let me that uh, yeah. it is some of the most important work we do because exhibitions are ephemeral. You know, the work come in, uh, work, works come in and then they leave. And um, while we're keeping this show up six months in order to sort of exploit its program, programmatic possibilities and spent and give a lot of time for our uh, region and our neighbors and our community to come in and see it the ex the catalog becomes really the documentation of the experience and deeper obviously you're not putting a book on the gallery walls so this is where the research and scholarship gets shown shown up i'll say that that's an old um imagine that's the spine it's going to fold so it looks a little funny when you look at it opened up like that and that's also an old version of the cover i think it looks nicer now um, but yeah, typically you're, you're, um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of work. <laughs> the catalog itself is, is its own project, but it is something that, that, you know, m memorializes things in a way. I, I, what I wanted to add, this is why I'm sort of stumbling here that thought in the back of my head is that we're now, you know, it's, it's the COVID world now and museums, which were slow to, um, adapt to dig digital uh, interpretation 
um, digital uh, programming. Um, that's a whole nother way that you can reach out to people and make things last now. And one of the things I love about the opportunities of working with the internet and digital programs is that so much of the work we do that might be like this talk, for example, if Daniel and I were giving this in the museum, we might be talking to 80 or 90 people and then it's over. But now we're allowed to talk to you and have it recorded and have it live. And so, so much of the work we do that might be ephemeral gets to live longer through this other digital world, which is really exciting. Absolutely. And the catalog is such an important record because this is something that we are going to share um, you know, everywhere. Um, it will be produced as a printed book, but we're also going to offer it as an ebook edition. And so we hope that we can reach new audiences with this. And um, th this is a photo of the designer of the publication, Greg Pitlick, whom um, uh, Sarah brought him, involved him with the museum, as he, she used to work with him on projects for Pittsburgh, and he's done an outstanding job with the design. So there's the research part of it that comes is the basis, the contents, and then it's working with Greg to make sure how does that all fit together? How do we present it? How do we illustrate it? Those are his creative ideas that go into making the cover, for example, and then of course the, the interior. So it's really rewarding. And so the, the catalog, just to give you a preview, it will have three essays, um, one by David Tafteri, a foreword by Sarah, a catalog, uh, an essay by me, and then one, also an essay by Mark Letzer from Maryland Center for History and Culture, and then a catalog of the works of art exhibited authored by me, in addition to a bibliography. So it, it's really an important testament to the interpretation of the artist's work and the historical cultural context. We have a question here in the Q&A. Um, it's asking, are there instances where the lender specifically designates how and where the art is displayed? That's a good question. They won't necessarily tell you where to put it unless, for example, um, let's say we were doing a larger scale show and there were more than, than one curator. Um, if we had two or three curators from each institution and we all made it a bigger Joshua Johnson catalog, doubled the number of works and had co-curators, people, you know, there's sort of more of a, um, a grouping of scholars, then yes, somebody might be able to say, I prefer this there and that there. But because we're really the primary organizers, um, we generally get to choose where they're gonna go. I can, but, I can <laughs> instances where certainly how, I mean, so, sometimes, uh, glass or bronze or ivory, you know, things need to be in climate control cases. Um, so that may be specified. Um, the glass show I did, all the glass needed to be at uh, slightly lower RH. So we had to slowly drop the galleries that were gonna have glass in it 2% a day to reach the RH. We decided to do that rather than, you know, we were a modestly sized museum. We couldn't afford that many climate control cases. Um, we had a couple, but we couldn't afford to do it for that entire 150 piece exhibition. So there are certain kinds of materials that um, need to be displayed certain ways. And certainly museums are gonna demand that and smart um, private collectors are gonna make sure. And of course, as museum professionals, we wanna take care of things the right way regardless. Um, but the, the only other thing I can think of is there could be religious artifacts that need to be displayed appropriately with the appropriate kind of dignity. And so you usually would have a conversation about something like that. And I did a huge Islamic show at one point. Um, I, I was in love with the courier. She was a wonderful person. <laughs> I had her to my house for lunch. But we talked very carefully about the Korans and the, and the religious materials that were gonna be in the show and what was the appropriate space in the museum for those to go. Um, you know, I was pretty much figured out before she got there, but I did, I did wanna make sure that we had those conversations. I think we had them by email before she came. So um, there are reasons why how would definitely, could definitely be requested where is usually something you hash out with your curatorial team and your designers in advance. And, and uh, uh, you know, unless you have some incredibly influential private collector who's like incredibly demanding and you're gonna listen to them, um, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna take their advice on where to hang their piece. 
Yes, and sometimes they'll also ask for specific hanging hardware. If, for example, it's a stark frame or there's something logistical or specific to that piece, they will also put that in on the loan agreement, the documentation that they officially acknowledges the loan. So those are some of the, even if you want to get even more detailed, those sure. might be issues that come up. Like small things that would be security hardware or audible alarms, um, valuable things that might require alarms, that sort of thing, yeah. So with this uh, image of the one of the catalog cover prototypes, I think that brings us to the end of the slides, but we would be happy to take further questions. We do have a couple questions here. Um, one of them um, is from a bit earlier and it asks why um, did Johnson only paint two portraits of African Americans and was it because of his means? For their means maybe in, in being able to commission portraits. Yes, I think that it, a number of factors. One, not all of Johnson's work survives. I am pretty confident that he painted other members of the black community in Baltimore, which was quite sizable at the time. And there were plenty of free Blacks. And number two, as Sarah was saying, means certainly, and you know, achieving a certain status in society that would warrant, not warrant, but necessitate commissioning a portrait. You had fewer uh, people of color at that time than, than whites who would have you know, wanted or, or, or commissioned a portrait. So there are a number of factors, but I think a number of them didn't survive actually, which is something that happens. Um, the other question we have right now is, um, will you include any artists other than Johnston? Yes. Um, as I showed a couple slides back, we are going to have a selection of contemporaries of Joshua Johnson. And that includes artists like Frederick Kemmelmeyer and this um, really lovely unknown uh, by an unknown artist, The Portrait of a Girl. And Maryland Center for History and Culture is going to loan, for example, their George Beck here, the landscape. So you're going to see, I think it's, I'm going to think at the moment, it's probably at least 12 works by other artists. So I see we have a question about wall color. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'm, I am uh, I, I love color and I had a lot of fun with color in my prior job, but I will say that um, the galleries at uh, Washington County Museum of Fine Arts are not flexible right now in terms of being able to change the wall color. So we have to work with graphic design and the way we install the show to try and create drama. We, we can't paint in that particular space yet. And so we'll get there. I, I've only been there seven months, we'll get there. Were there any other questions? Uh, we just well, have a comment in here. Um, FYI, there's a large standing portrait by Kemmel Meyer in the collection of Heritage Frederick. Very interesting. I was not aware of that. I, I know that he worked in both mm -hmm. Frederick and Hagerstown, but I didn't know about the one that's um, so nearby to Hagerstown. Thank you. Um, and one more question just came in. How large will the exhibition be and what gallery will it be in? The, ex the exhibition consists of 26 total works and it will be in the Grow Gallery of the museum, which is the largest gallery for changing exhibitions that we have. And it will be accompanied by an exhibition of contemporary portraits from the 18th and 19th centuries from our collection called Face to Face. So the space is going to basically be divided and um, you'll get a sense of the larger world of portraiture while you also um, get to meet Joshua Johnson. Um, so I, I'll just reiterate um, as we wrap up here, um, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Um, it's fun. I always like talking about the way we do our work. Um, the exhibition opens April 17th and runs through October 24th. We have a whole roster of complementary programs planned. Um, in fact, the kickoff 
because we can't really do exhibition openings right now, our um, opening event will be the next Let's Talk Art on April 22nd, in which we will have the catalog authors um, for, um, they will do most of the talking and I will sort of be the moderator um, on April 22nd. Um, and so that should be great. That's David Terry from Morgan University and Mark Letzer from the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Um, we have a program related to um, our Yo portraits that explores the genealogy of the city sitters and will also give some hints at how to start your own genealogical research. We've got a three part program in the fall on uh, African American music. Devona Rowe is partnering with us on that, and she's just fa a fabulous performer, teacher, and historian. Um, and it's going to be a combination of lectures slash demos and performance to go talking about antebellum plantation life, um, Negro spirituals and folk music, as well as uh, classically composed art songs by African-American composers, and then um, some performances at the end. This is all planned to be streamed, I will say, because we just don't know um, when we can do in-person programs again and gather folks from different households together. Um, so just watch our, our website and uh, look for the programs because we're really excited to try to explore the world of Joshua Johnson in more detail. And uh, I will just end, and if Daniel has other comments, he can certainly chime in, but I do wish I could raise a glass with all of you to celebrate Joshua Johnson and all the hard work of everyone who was involved in this show. Um, but while it is safe for you to visit the museum, it is not safe for us to be together. So um, I do hope you will come to the museum on your own to see the results of the more than two years of hard work and join us um, next time online for Let's Talk Our New Perspectives on Joshua Johnson. Good night, everybody, and thanks for thank being you.